A recent study found that the greatest mass extinction ever occurred about 250 million years ago. To put that in our human context, we've been around on this planet as a species for about 200,000 years. When you have to look back that far for comparisons, you're into pretty alarming territory. That massive die-off, this study showed, was triggered by rapidly acidifying oceans. Then the source was huge amounts of carbon dioxide that were released by volcanic eruption. Now the source is us. Carbon pollution from burning fossil fuels is raising sea levels measurably, warming our waters measurably, and acidifying our seas. The sea level at Naval Station Newport is up 10 inches since the 1930s. And the mean winter water temperature in Narragansett Bay is three to four degrees warmer since the late 1950s. That is an ecosystem shift that is affecting our local fishermen today. So we're trying to do a little bit about it in Washington. Senator Lisa Murkowski of Alaska and I founded a Senate Oceans Caucus pledging to focus on those issues facing our oceans and coasts where we could find bipartisan support. These areas include marine debris, pirate fishing, and ocean data monitoring. I've also been working to establish a national endowment for the oceans to provide a stable funding stream for restoration, protection, and research into our ocean and coastal resources. National Endowment for the Oceans we call NEO. At NEO is structured to create a true endowment, generating interest and spending only a percentage of the fund every year so that it can grow and provide more and more support over time. Bob Ballard has described as a, quote, major problem, I'll quote him here, the disconnect between the importance of oceans and the meager funds we as a nation invest to not only understand their complexity, but to become responsible stewards of the bounty they represent. The National Endowment for the Oceans will help us become responsible stewards. We cannot just take. We must also listen. So I don't want to see the Atlantic opened up to risky oil and gas development, and I don't want to see the Arctic opened up to oil drilling either. A couple of years ago I wrote a book, Rescue Warriors. It's about the men and women who every day go out on our blue frontier to face challenges that a generation ago might have seemed unimaginable. We talk about marine protected areas and then the question is who's protecting them. Um, it's it's an organization where the armed services, the only armed service that uh, is probably under-resourced for the job it's given. Um, former Commandant said that, you know, the job of the US Coast Guard is to uh, protect men from the sea and the sea from men. And I'd like to introduce uh, the present 25th Commandant of the US Coast Guard, Admiral Paul Zukun. David, thank you very much. And I appreciate this opportunity to appear before you. And as David alluded to, we do protect those on the sea. We protect the nation from threats coming from the sea, and we protect the sea itself. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about what we're doing in the Coast Guard to protect the sea. And trust me, there are plenty of others that are using the sea for ill-gotten gains. And it's not just Shell, there's a whole litany of others that are lining up to exploit the riches in the Arctic. I don't deal with the, with the policy, I deal with the consequences. And for a service that prides itself on being semper paratus, I need to make sure that we're ready in the Arctic as well. And we often say, well, this is really hard. It costs a lot of money to build an icebreaker. Now, it costs $14 billion to build one aircraft carrier. We've got 11. And roughly, it'll cost about a billion if you only build one. Now, if you build more than one icebreaker, the cost goes down considerably. But we have 11 carrier strike groups. We have two equally national assets in icebreakers. We are the world's most prosperous nation. Our GDP is eight times that of Russia. Yet Russia has nearly three dozen ocean-going icebreakers. You can do the math for yourself. We have not put our money down where it matters in the Arctic if we are seriously going to be an Arctic nation in the 21st century. 
The last big game changer when it comes to operating in an ice environment was the sinking of the Titanic 103 years ago. Today, the United States Coast Guard is still flying the International Ice Patrol as a result of the sinking of the Titanic 103 years ago. <laughs> Next year, a cruise ship is going to ply the Northwest Passage. It will, it will run from west to east. It will be operating in a domain where about 5% of those waters are charted to 21st century standards. And so what if they discover a pinnacle? And you might ask, what's the likelihood of that? There's a pinnacle up in the Arctic called the Healy Seamount, because the Coast Guard Cutter Healy, they discovered it, fortunately with their side scan sonar and not with their hull. <laughs> but if a cruise ship discovers a pinnacle and it hits it, it's going to sink. And the loss of life will be much greater than those 56 mariners on that Soviet trawler that sank, hauling back 80 tons of fish. And so that would be the black swan event, if you will, for the Arctic, saying, well, why weren't we ready for a contingency such as that in the Arctic? So are there challenges out there? Absolutely. You bet. Am I paying attention to it? You bet as well. I deal in the world of consequence management. I don't get on one side of the aisle or the other to address climate change, but we know for a fact the sea level is rising. It's not just in, at, at the Navy lab in, in Newport, Rhode Island. It's happening in our Pacific Island nations where you have a spring tide and islands are literally up to their ankles in water. Uh, it's happening in the world around us. The sea temperature is rising and with no further and the bleaching of sea corals out in the wide Pacific domain as well. It is a reality. I take to heart our role as your United States Coast Guard to protect the sea itself. Thank you very much for having me this morning. 15 years ago in 2000, BP took me out on some of their deep water rigs and I asked the rig boss, the company man on one, I said, what happens if you get a blowout a mile or two down? He says, well, Dave, I guess we'll find out when it happens. So 10 years later, we found out, and now we're entering new frontier waters in the Arctic. Um, it, it just makes you wonder about the precautionary principle and how we approach this vast blue frontier that is so unexplored and so new. And, and it's just, it's a reality we have that, you know, this is most of our planet. When you, you know, if you don't believe it, go out into space and look back and you realize it's, it's not God's green earth, it's God's blue marble. And somebody who actually has been out in space and has seen that blue marble is Dr. Kathy Sullivan, who's the administrator of the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration. There aren't that many government agencies that uh, actually do more with less. So imagine how much more they could do with a little more. Well, thank you, David, uh, for that nice introduction and the invitation and opportunity to be here with all of you today. Yeah, the backdrop has been well painted uh, by the Senator, by the Commandant, uh, and you all came to this room this morning knowing it very vividly yourselves anyway, because this is what you're passionate about. You know, David's right. Uh, any of us who have had the opportunity to fly in space, uh, are, we know better than the metaphor uh, that they, we really, whoever named this planet Terra way back when, you know, was just way off the mark. It really should have been called Aqua. That is what we depend on. Uh, the water in the system, from the salt to the fresh, and the dynamics, the interconnections that make all these systems work together to create the living planet that we, that we enjoy. And to me, as I listen to it, all that has been said uh, by the Senator, by the Commandant, uh, I see these threads weaving back and forth through all these conversations. We extract food, oxygen, energy from the sea, and the cascade of feedbacks back into the sea and into our economy and into our societies are you know, rich beyond measure, difficult to fathom. One of the key things that we're pushing hard on in the agency right now is goes along those very lines. You know, if you think about it, you've got a longer history and really an easier measurement problem when it comes to understanding the atmosphere and turning that understanding into practical prediction like weather forecasts. The ocean poses a harder challenge. Satellites can whiz around the planet at 17,000, 20,000 miles an hour a lap around the planet in 90 minutes. So, and it, seeing through the atmosphere is much easier than seeing through the ocean. And that's why it's been possible to have almost snapshots, simultaneous snapshots of the condition of the atmosphere. 
the physics of the atmosphere, and the skin of our planet, the land cover, the surface temperature of the ocean, the surface color of the ocean. But it's much, much harder to get a synoptic sense of the ocean, even just of the seafloor. It's been said several times, we know more about space than we do about our oceans. We certainly have far better maps of the moon and of Mars than we have of our own seafloor. That's not just due to benign neglect. It's also due to these fundamental physics that it's a harder problem to get that kind of map, that kind of resolution. So a research ship, in the time a satellite goes all the way around the Earth, a research ship has maybe done 15 or 20 miles. You know, those are real world challenges that we're up against when it comes to the prospect of trying to develop some predictive skill in understanding and managing our living oceans that might start to be akin to the predictive skill we have with our atmospheric system. So we're pushing very, very hard on that. Uh, we're seeking from the Congress in the current budget year and this coming one. We're looking for advances on our funding on ecosystem-based management, uh, on better understanding of uh, coastal ecosystems on all of these different fronts. It's becoming increasingly clear in the halls of government, in the corporate arena of insurance and reinsurance, that we must find ways to build forward. And so we have just entered into five commercial R&D agreements with Google, Microsoft, Amazon, IBM, and the Open Cloud Consortium to try to port all this data out into the open world so that, again, you, scientists, innovators, can help us understand and recognize what the really valuable complements of the data are. And we hope that will do two things. One is put better information and tools into your hands and the hands of decision makers. And secondly, is help us better understand which data, which measurements, which monitoring and assessment of this planet are of greatest value to the kinds of challenges and decisions that we all face as we work to try to conserve and preserve this amazing blue planet that we live on, and in particular, to ensure the bounty of the oceans endures for decades to come. Thank you very much. One of our last, uh, last year's Peter Benchley Ocean Award winners says the challenge is simply to scale up the solutions more rapidly than the problems. And uh, Dr. Rayanna Elizabeth Johnson, uh, she went to Harvard, she went to Scripps. Today she could be doing what a lot of scientists do and writing peer-reviewed studies on um, krill, fecal strings, impact on carbon sequestration. <laughs> but instead, She's working with the uh, Wayne Institute to collect, create, and amplify the best ideas in ocean conservation. So, yes, I'm at the Wayne Institute right now, but before that, one of my most formative experiences was during my PhD research. As part of that research, I interviewed over 400 individuals, fishermen and scuba instructors, on Curacao and Bonaire, including a 70-year-old fisherman who was the spear fishing champion of Curacao in 1960. Um, here are photographs of him in 1969 with a Goliath grouper and a string of other groupers that he caught just free diving with a snorkel right offshore. By the time I got to Curacao in 2009, these photos on the bottom show you what spear fishermen with a full day of scuba diving were able to catch, mostly herbivores and small fish. That is a dramatic change within our lifetimes. I hope you're familiar with the report, The Status and Trends of Coral Reef Fisheries from 1970 to 2012. Because of this report that was released last year by the Global Coral Reef Monitoring Network and the IUCN, led by Dr. Jeremy Jackson, um, we know definitively what needs to be done to repair coral reefs. This report was co-authored by 90 scientists analyzing data from 35,000 surveys of Caribbean reefs conducted over 42 years, showing that coral has declined 50% since 1970 in the Caribbean. But it also showed that if we protect key herbivores, like parrotfish and urchins, so that they can eat algae off of coral reefs, if we control coastal pollution and construction, then we can put Caribbean reefs on the mend. It is based on my reading of the scientific literature, on what I learned in my time at NOAA, at Scripps Institution of Oceanography, and at the Waite Foundation, and at gatherings like these, that over the last two years, I have led creation of the Waite Institute's Blue Halo Initiative. This is now the primary focus of the Waite Institute. We partner with governments and communities as they envision 
create and implement sustainable ocean management. Our recipe for ocean conservation has three main attributes. It's comprehensive, it's science-based, and it's community-driven. It's supposed to be fun. Beyond food security, a lot of what motivates me is the vibrant coastal cultures that need healthy oceans. Fish fries, learning to fish from your parents, swimming in clear waters. Without healthy oceans, not only are livelihoods and food security threatened, but cultures are threatened. Ocean conservation is to some degree about cultural preservation. I'd like to point out in particular David Helvard's article at the end of last year about top 10 ocean stories in the US. He highlighted the fact that a judge ruled uh, British Petroleum as grossly negligent, that the Senate unanimously ratified treaties cracking down on illegal fishing, that Illinois banned microbead products, that pro-ocean candidates were getting elected. And I also wrote an article about these, uh, the ocean conservation winds of 2014. It was a huge year for the establishment of marine reserves. Kiribati, Palau, the Cook Islands, the Pacific Remote Island National Monument, world leaders were gathering to focus on ocean issues, the State Department and in The Hague. Shark Week viewers for the first time turned towards conservation. Most of the coverage of that week was critical. In Australia, the shark culling resulted in massive widespread protests of that bizarre and irresponsible policy. Ocean zoning is gaining traction. Now over 30 countries are using ocean zoning as a management tool. The U.S. West Coast ground fishery recovered from overfishing. The Clinton Global Initiative has now joined Team Ocean with a program focused on oceans. Seafood sustainability is being tackled by policymakers and technologists. I'm sorry, traceability is being tackled by policymakers and technologists. Plastic pollution is getting sustained attention and local efforts to combat ocean acidification are increasing with Washington State leading the way and Maryland and Maine on their tails. I wrote this article listing the conservation winds of last year on Christmas Eve, much to my mother's chagrin, when it became clear that no one else was going to write it. People are eager for good news, so let's share it, we have some, and let's create much more and bigger good ocean news together and with new collaborators. It's time to get creative. We can use the ocean without using it up. And it seems that now the tide is in our favor. We must not squander that. Thank you.